Welcome to Mayo Clinic Q&A. We're recording this episode on April the 15th, 2020, and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. The COVID battle continues in the United States, and we are back today with infectious disease expert and virologist, Dr. Greg Poland uh, from the Mayo Clinic, who's been visiting with us regularly about the epidemic. Hi, Dr. Poland. Hey, good to be back. What do you have to share with us for updates today? Well, you know, a few. Uh, one, just to update the numbers as of this morning, we have passed an unfortunate mark of at least 2 million documented cases in the U.S. with about 128,000 deaths. 30% of those cases are in the U.S. where we have about 614,000 cases and about 26,000 deaths. In those cases, Surprisingly, uh, in some respects, 9,300 of those cases are healthcare providers. It's a serious issue not only for the public, but it's a serious issue for you and I as healthcare providers. Those numbers are really staggering. Why does the United States seem right now to be overrepresented? I, I think part of it is we've actually done more testing than other countries, so we're aware of more numbers. I think we also have. Uh, concentrations of people in our major cities where we didn't have the social distancing happening perhaps as fast as it might have. And so you have community transmission and spread of the virus. You, you note that we don't have those sorts of large numbers of cases, if you will, in the interior of the U.S. It's kind of been along the southern rim, the west coast and the east coast. Now that can change, of course, but uh, I think we've really learned the lesson of social distancing, respiratory etiquette, and hand etiquette. I have read that there's a new saliva test available for COVID-19, which would certainly be preferable to people over that nasal swab that I see them using on yeah. the news when they're in the test centers. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, you know, we don't have details in terms of a peer-reviewed publication, but very simply what it is, it's another molecular diagnostic test. It's spitting into a tube and then using that rather than blood to perform RT-PCR assays. Now, there's some issues with that. On the plus side is the immense benefit at the, at the uh, population level to not have to be face-to-face -face with a healthcare worker, which puts two people at risk, and to mail these out and perform this kind of testing. That would be very useful. The, the flip side of the coin, though, is we don't know the operating characteristics of the test. You know, when somebody spits into a tube, it's really three different fluids. It's salivary gland fluid. It's what's called crevicular fluid that seeps out from the gums. And then it's, you know, or <laughs> that kind of sputum, actually. So the, the operating characteristics of the test are likely to be such that it won't be as sensitive as the more uncomfortable nasopharyngeal swab test, but we don't know that yet. Even as an anesthesiologist dealing with a lot of uh, intubations and, and secretions, I've never given them uh, quite names or thought about them that, that clearly before, so <laughs> it's enlightening. You talked about the data and the numbers of uh, individuals dying, which is really tragic. Mm. We have noted that more men seem to be dying of COVID-19 than women. What might be the reason for this? You know, that's, it is a really important scientific question. This has been noticed everywhere there have been large outbreaks. Interestingly enough, some data published by CDC shows that there's worse severity of this disease in young male children versus female. And this is a hint that it isn't just hormonal, as people have suggested. We see that same trend in prepubertal gender differences, and we see the same trend in postmenopausal trends. So uh, this is an interesting observation. Our laboratory does studies where we use live attenuated vaccines as a proxy, if you will, for viral infection. And in all those studies, women have superior immune responses to men. The same I have heard about children, that the children don't seem to be as affected uh, with infections as adults. Um, does that mean they're not infected and they can't pass the virus, or maybe we don't know? No, they probably are infected. In fact, I think one of the things that we're going to find out is that the base of the pyramid of who's been infected is deeper and broader than we thought. 
when we get to the point where we can do widespread serology to see who's been infected, my guess is that we'll have a high rate of children, uh, at least in the bigger cities for sure, that, that have been infected. They tend to be asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. That doesn't mean they can't develop severe disease and even die, but that's a much rarer occurrence with children than it is for older adults. No one particularly knows why. There are theories, including one called cytokine storm, where our own immune system overreacts as older adults and actually causes problems rather than helping the immune system. When patients are known to be uh, infected, there's a lot of discussion about contact tracing. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think Mayo Clinic has even uh, been working on some... Um, uh, applications to be able to do this uh, without violating perhaps uh, patient confidentiality, et cetera, uh, some mm -hmm. unique uses of that. What is it meant by contact tracing and what is the utility of it? Yeah, great question. That's something that is standardly done with infectious diseases. So for many infections that would occur, we would do contact tracing, that is go to somebody and we wouldn't reveal who, but um, a person has said that they've been in contact with you. They are now demonstrating, for example, tuberculosis. And we trace out who might have possibly become exposed and therefore infected so that we can offer treatment. So the whole idea, and this is really important in the beginning of an outbreak in order to contain the outbreak, is to understand who's infected and then in broader and broader rings, uh, trace who might have been exposed and therefore who might have been infected. If you can do that quickly and effectively and efficiently, you can, and modeling and, and real life data shows, you can dramatically decrease the impact of an epidemic or a pandemic. Well, we know that not everyone who is affected by COVID-19 needs to be hospitalized, and many of us don't live in isolation from our family members. How can one safely care for a COVID patient in the home uh, without uh, putting other family members at risk? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. It's a very important one for many of our patients where they may have a family member like that. What I would recommend is that if you have somebody at home that has symptomatic COVID, you want to treat the room that they stay in, in a sense, like a hospital room. What does that mean? limited incursions or excursions in or out of that room. That person is quarantined in that room, ideally with a window open, and you have to treat that room as infected. So uh, a paper released just uh, Friday showed that in hospital rooms, as an example, uh, the healthcare workers coming out of that room have the virus on the soles of their shoes. So that means you don't walk in and out of that room with shoes and take it into the rest of the house. That person is masked before they would come out. You don't have meals together. The hard surfaces that that person uh, is exposed to get, get wiped down with appropriate disinfectant solutions um, and, and a lot of care taken so that you don't pass this on. Now, You'd think that the risk of passing it on in the context of a family living together would be 100%. But that's actually not what the data shows. And I, I'm actually pretty surprised by this. It might be that some of it is that the rest of the family members are asymptomatic since we don't do as wide a testing as we would like to. But the numbers, in fact, show rates as low as 10%, as high as about 60 plus percent. So it is not inevitable, and I, I want to make that point because some people think, well, there's somebody in my house that has it, we're all going to get it. That's not necessarily true, and it doesn't have to be true. We are obviously still waiting for a vaccine for COVID-19, which may be in the offing um, quite some time. But the World Health Organization has warned that during this pandemic, children may be missing out on other immunizations that they would typically be receiving during this time. I'm wondering how does that affect them and what might be the long-term effects for the children and for society if that occurs? Yeah, this is a really important question. In fact, let me speak first globally. Both the polio eradication initiative and the global measles rubella 
initiation and efforts are all compromised. In some 37 countries, I think it is, they have suspended those programs because their healthcare workers are focused on dealing with COVID-19. So this is how I put it. We get a lot of patient questions about this. There are some vaccines. Let's take, for example, your second dose of Shingrix that we would say, well, we'd like you to get that second dose within six months of the first dose. So if you're not yet at that, that time point, let's delay that a little bit if it's appropriate in that particular patient's context. And this summer, when we hope this will further die down, that might be the time to do it. Where you can really imagine this being a, a concern, now remember that COVID hit the U.S. in February, was our first known case, very likely, this is speculation, we're going to see a second wave of this. And of course, the symptoms of influenza and COVID-19 overlap almost exactly in their initial presentation. So one of the messages I think we want to get out this year is that as fall approaches, we want people to get their flu vaccine as early as practical. Sometimes it's available in August and early September. That's ideal. Get it then. For kids in terms of uh, their routine childhood vaccines, I'm, I'm a fan of uh, understanding exactly the public health implications of those vaccines. So what I'm telling parents is call your health care provider and figure out, and this is the word that I use, how we choreograph this. You don't want to take healthy kids into a waiting room where there are sick people and have them wait for 30 or 60 minutes to get a well child check or a vaccine. And many medical offices that I'm hearing about are doing just that. They are choreographing it. We will text you when we want you to come into the office. You can wait in the parking lot or at home if you're nearby. And they're actually scheduling 15 minute appointments. You come in, you get immunized, you're out. So I, I think talk with your healthcare provider because these vaccines are important. If that's not done, is it possible to miss the window altogether for a child to receive vaccines? No. Um, and that's something other than Shingrix, where there's a little bit of an issue there with windows. There really is no vaccine licensed in the U.S. where if you're outside the ideal window, that we would start over. We would just take off from where we left and administer vaccines. That's not the ideal, but it's very doable. It's hard to keep up on those uh, yeah. uh, maintenance items sometimes yeah. during this when so much focus is going to the, to the illness itself. You often say, thank goodness, even though we sometimes complain about it, thank goodness for the electronic medical record. I can't remember my own medical history. Right. I would have no idea when I last had an immunization or what month I got my flu shot in for that matter. No, so that no, is good. A, my last tetanus shot was, I don't know, seven years ago, eight years ago. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Poland. Do you have any last um, words of wisdom or information you'd like to share with our listeners? Before yeah, we you know, I, I think something really important to say, and I, and I say this out of encouragement, people are stretched to the limit, right? It is difficult to give up our normal routine. It is particularly difficult if you're caring for elderly people or very young infants or have somebody sick in your home. It has been very hard for healthcare providers. And I just want to say the evidence is accumulating that we are starting to flatten and bend down this curve. It's a process. We've talked about the lag period. It's 14 to 28 days after you don't see any cases to know there won't be any more cases. So we've got a ways to go with this. People are working on roadmaps for how we slowly and in a phased in way reopen. But it's really important for all of us to one, be encouraged, and two, use that encouragement to hold the course and not prematurely fatigue of it and say, oh, forget it, I'm just gonna go out. That would be detrimental. And then we start all over again. That's a good reminder, and it really is good to hear some encouragement yeah. when things feel so uncertain. I think it's hard when people just don't know how long and uh, what this will look like exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Poland. Thank you for joining us on Mayo Clinic Q&A today. We've been visiting with Dr. Greg Poland, 
a virologist and infectious disease expert at the Mayo Clinic who has kindly shares, shared his time with us multiple times now already and will be back with us again. Thanks so much, Greg. Thank you. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.